My name is Tom Delick, and I am part of the Asian Equity Fund research team. Today, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, James Morton, founder and CIO of Santa Lucia Asset Management and lead fund manager of the CIM Dividend Income Fund. James has a long history of value investing in Asia, with the CIM Dividend Income Fund having over a 20-year track record of delivering attractive returns to investors. The strategy has consistently provided a high level of income for investors, while also producing strong capital appreciation. After over 40 years of economic reform, China has grown to become a major driver of both Asian and global growth. For fund managers investing in Asia, understanding China has become one of the most important topics of discussion. James has a wealth of experience built from his on-the-ground research and analysis of China. We are pleased he can join us today to take us through his view on the progress China has made so far and what lies ahead for the country and its financial markets for the rest of the decade. Over to you, James. Thank you, Tom, uh, and a warm welcome from Singapore. So this session is about China in the current decade, and I've entitled it, May You Live in Interesting Times, which uh, might or might not be a blessing or a curse, but it also might or might not have originated with Confucius. And indeed, one question is, is it actually a Chinese saying at all? Uh, well, the answer is unclear, but it looks most likely that the phrase was first used in a letter by written by the British ambassador uh, to Sir Austin Chamberlain, and uh, that was in the 1930s. Uh, but it did refer to something that Chamberlain had used in a speech from his grandfather in the 1890s. So perhaps more British than Chinese. And if in fact this is uh, misinformation to attribute this particular phrase to China, then I think it's just symptomatic of the large amount of misinformation uh, that exists today in the Western media about China. Now, to some extent, this is understandable. Um, Western media and China don't tend to see eye to eye on much. Um, but, uh, you know, the uh, truth is it's hard to find good, unbiased um, and accurate information about uh, what's going on in China, um, inside China as well, of course, as outside. So in this session, I'm going to try and provide a few facts that I hope will help investors think about their investment uh, opportunities in China, and uh, also um, hopefully this will be free from any of the bias you read in, in the Western media. Um, I want to start with uh, today where we are. China is very much President Xi's China. Uh, this is the year, as you will know, of the hundredth of uh, years since the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, and uh, it's very important to understand policy in China. In fact, as you think about investments, uh, understanding the policy of the Communist Party under Xi is really uh, the single most important thing, sadly, uh, even more important than financial, quantitative, uh, and contextual analysis that we do every day in portfolio management. Because China is being molded in his image, and it's important to recognize that he's a true believer. Um, and he is not remotely interested in democracy or views, and in fact, he views the West as, as decadent. Um, probably thinks we're currently experiencing the, the modern equivalent of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But he has some very clear overall objectives. So there, if you care to see it, first and foremost, um, he wants Communist Party control uh, of everything, actually, uh, every aspect of life. And uh, this is probably objective one, two, and three. Uh, but uh, alongside that, and in order to keep the peace, uh, he wants a moderately prosperous society and one which is more egalitarian then has uh, emerged because China has one of the world's most skewed Gini coefficients right now. It's higher even than the US. Um, so common prosperity is the term she is using at the moment. He's used it over 60 times in speeches this year through August uh, versus 20 times last year in uh, total. Um, and it's leveling up though. I mean, it's not, it's not just about soap the rich uh, or even tax the rich, uh, it's share the wealth up to a point, but create the wealth first, so there's more to share. Um, in addition, he has a third objective, to have a cleaner country. Um, and this is a very popular objective of the Chinese, too, who've now reached a point 
uh, where they want some of the qualitative aspects of the standard of living, not just the quantitative aspects. Um, and so uh, this combined leads to policy priorities which are fairly consistent and support the objectives. Uh, SOE reform has been something he's engaged in since he arrived, um, rooting out corruption and trying to make SOE companies run more efficiently and, and even actually reviewing uh, capital allocation, which was uh, Chinese SOEs were great value destroyers for many years. Um, leveling up, as I said, this is about people making more money. In fact, we have a, a program, which is a sort of pilot program in Jiang province right now. Uh, and one of its key goals is that every uh, Chinese citizen should have a disposable income, and I stress the word disposable, of um, eleven. Uh, $1,570 uh, by 2025, which is not that far away. And when you think about it, disposable income at that level is, in fact, um, going to give you a pretty comfortable life. Um, in addition, there's a comprehensive menu of environmental initiatives and regulations, and these things are a uh, constant uh, state of flux with nudging of various industries. Uh, and almost every month, you get some new pronouncement that helps make China a cleaner place. Now, Xi also has some of his own signature initiatives. Uh, one Belt, One Road got a lot of uh, publicity and it hasn't been talked about much recently, but it's still very active. We've talked to companies and uh, part of their international growth is aligned here. Chinese financial institutions are engaging with governments and companies, particularly in Southeast Asia and Africa. This, this program is part of uh, spreading China's soft power. Uh, Regional comprehensive economic partnership is something that's been pretty much ignored, but is an extremely important um, aspect uh, of this, which is the signing of countries representing some 33-34% of the world's GDP, so everybody really in the region except for India, um, to create a free trade zone. Uh, the Greater Bay Area um, really encompasses the Guangdong province um, and Hong Kong and Macau. Um, now, there are several of these regional initiatives inside of China, which involve uh, free trade zones, special uh, uh, privileges and tax incentives for certain industries that are priorities to be developed uh, in China. Um, and also in particular in the Greater Bay Area, which is, is his signature and number one um, priority of this particular program, uh, integrate Hong Kong and Macau. And thirdly, Made in China 2025, which we hear very little of today, because it was the policy which really upset the US government, uh, because it was at that moment they, they understood that China's objectives were to catch up in areas of strategic technology. This is actually very, very active and going on. And when you talk to Chinese companies, as we do on a regular basis, um, this is a key issue for them in terms of what their contribution is going to be. This program is uh, absolutely active. It's just not getting the uh, publicity that it used to. So if you look at these things and pull them all together, you start to get a sense of which industries are going to be favoured, which are out of favour, and you really need to make sure your portfolio in China, uh, whether it's uh, uh, equities or bonds, is lined up alongside with President Xi if you want to make money um, and also reduce risk. So moving on to China itself, I want to go through a few key points that you know, this country has changed uh, in a way that's really almost unimaginable. Um, it's still changing very rapidly and it will continue to change. And it's the pace of change, which I think is um, pretty significant and also obviously slightly disruptive to investment strategies. Let's highlight some of the things which have made a huge difference over the last 30 years. Uh, poverty is disappearing and of course there are more rich people as well, which has a lot of implications for investing. But the workforce and the population are both declining. Um, the money supply growth has been very robust for a long time, but it's now tapering off. Now, the Li Keqiang Index uh, is, a, is really the best, um, I think, measure of economic activity in China. And you can see, as we will look at some slides later, it's stabilizing today. The investment balance, interestingly, is shifting because for many years, capital was going into China, flowing one way now. It's much more balanced and there's a lot of capital going out of China to invest in other countries. And for foreign investors, I think the key concerns um, have evolved in such a way that they now are focused around the currency, uh, inflation in the country, and most of all, perhaps 
uh, regulation. So let's look at all these things. I'll whip through a few statistics quickly. Uh, first of all, Chinese poverty rate. Um, you know, as you can see from the World Bank statistics, uh, you know, there are really aren't many poor people left in China. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. Yes, there are uh, 600 million people who would still be described as poor, uh, but not in extreme poverty. Um, and this has only taken 30 years uh, to transform a country where at least 800 million people now have a decent standard of living, and, and even the rest, 600, are a lot better off than they were at the beginning of this. Moving on to the actual wealth in the country, you can see that China now has the second largest uh, number of rich people in the world. Well, you say perhaps they should, given that they are one of the two largest countries by population. Still a long way behind the US, but, but catching up very fast. Uh, until recent regulations, in fact, China was creating two billionaires uh, a week. Um, and uh, particularly, uh, you can see the strength there in the 50 to 100 million uh, dollar net worth range, these ultra high net worth individuals. And um, this, of course, has implications for money that's available for investing in domestic equities and bonds. Uh, population change. China's uh, one child policy has really hit now. Uh, population growth has actually turned um, negative. Uh, the lowest turning point was reached six years ago, which really affects the economy and the structure of economic activity in China. And we now get to the point where the policymakers are actually um, encouraging people to have three children. We now have moved from the one-child policy to the three-child policy. The one-child policy was pretty effective. The three-child policy, I rather suspect, will not be so effective. It's um, even telling people not to look at um, computer games is not necessarily going to produce more children, although certainly a lot of the recent policy pronouncements have been designed to lower the cost of raising a child and, and therefore encouraging people to get their family size up. Um, the money supply, obviously a key factor uh, in growing an economy, and you can see here we have data uh, going, going back um, 20 plus years. M2 growth peaked um, very significantly after the global financial crisis. Um, and it needed to because China was doing the heavy lifting for the potential uh, world recession that might have occurred, but fortunately it didn't. But uh, also velocity, uh, not only growth, but velocity is slowing down, which has implications for you know, where you want to put your money if you're looking for value and growth. Um, now, actually, uh, moving on to the credit cycle, the uh, Chinese monetary policy has been remarkably, and fiscal policy, has been remarkably orthodox and very little stimulus due to COVID last year, unlike many other countries. Um, so uh, we've actually had the US and uh, China more or less at opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of uh, dishing out cash and keeping conditions fairly tight. What is interesting uh, from an investment standpoint is, is this now changing? You know, has the US reached a point where it you know, it can't go any further. Literally, the, the economy can't cope with the flush of liquidity that's being sent its way. Whereas in China, um, we might be starting to see a new um, phase of easing. And every time, this is some very interesting data, which has been compiled by Alpine Macro, uh, every time there have been reserve requirement ratio cuts, the credit impulse has ticked up. And that's been a bit of a boom. So we just had one uh, reserve requirement ratio cut a few weeks ago. Um, which amazingly occurred just days after it was mooted um, by the BBOC. And now there's talk of another, and I think this is going to be very interesting. So we will go from credit constraint perhaps to more uh, credit flush. And then if we take the next um, Clyde, you can see, as I said, in COVID, um, China did very, very little in terms of cutting central bank rates um, last year to, uh, to stimulate the economy, which means it has lots of firepower today. Uh, and I think that's very important because after all, investing is about the future, not the past. Um, which brings me to the Li Kang Index. It's always been a bit of a question mark. You know, do we believe Chinese statistics? And uh, so here's some 15 plus years of this index, which was created by the current premier. Um, it's 40% based on electricity production, 20% on railway freight, and 40% on um, uh, volume of freight. Now, uh, sorry, bank loans. Now, this is some um, genuine economic indicator because the statistics, bank loans, uh, electricity production, and freight, they are all very good quality 
uh, statistics, but data is hard, robust, and reliable. Uh, so what you see here is you know, a reflection of Chinese growth, again, big, big spike up after the global financial crisis, and indeed after the collapse of COVID, we've had a big spike, but turning down a bit now, which also I think explains the likely increase uh, in money supply coming our way shortly. Turning again to the investment profile in China, for years China has been a consumer of capital from overseas, but uh, starting about six years ago, um, certainly they have started to significantly export capital, a lot of it linked to um, President Xi's One Belt, One Road policy. So. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. I just got off the, off the phone with a Chinese company that's um, building cement plants all around Africa. Now, um, for foreign investors, key issues, um, obviously currency. And um, you know, if you're going to buy uh, Chinese assets, you're going to end up owning renminbi. Um, long history here, going back um, some 40 years, uh, obviously China has a controlled currency, the rates are fixed. Uh, it's not a freely traded currency in any sense of the word uh, at the moment, although interesting signs that it could become so um, in the not too distant future. Um, clearly, uh, it's priced initially at the wrong rate, found a new much higher rate. But what, what I find interesting about this chart is that actually, since the global financial crisis some, some 10 plus years ago, the trading range of the renminbi in the US dollar hasn't actually been that great. Um, so your, your currency exposure, which people talk about a lot in currency risk, actually not that great. And on balance, I think you wouldn't expect the renminbi to be stronger than the US dollar if you look out the next five years. And who, apart from anything else, the Chinese government uh, is keen on dual circulation, stimulation of the domestic economy. You need a stronger currency to do that. The second reason is uh, the government is getting closer and closer to internationalizing the renminbi, not just through the digital yuan, but particularly through trade, finance, and linked to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So I have no doubt that China, in their mind, wants to have the renminbi at least to be as influential as the US dollar, and ultimately more influential, and they would ideally like to supplant the US dollar. Uh, now, as, as de Gaulle pointed out, having the, the global currency in your back pocket is a wonderful weapon. Um, the Chinese certainly would like to have that. So this, I think, is going to be an area of great tension, but. What I do believe is that investors will find um, they will get a real return better from China bonds and assets uh, than in the US, and partly because inflation has been such a destabilizing factor in the past. If you look at this um, picture, you can see two big spikes in Chinese inflation historically. Um, one of them was around the time of Tiananmen Square, um, and it was definitely a factor uh, in, in that disruption, um, uh, and the tragedies followed from it. Now, uh, the second time was what caused the big spike in renminbi devaluation that you saw on the previous chart. And these two events are absolutely seared in the minds of Chinese Communist Party officials. They are very, very anxious to avoid inflation um, uh, because they associate it with instability. They associate it with social unrest, uh, which are two things to be avoided um, as at any cost. And um, they have... I think opportunities here, apart from you know, if you want to keep inflation low, a stronger currency again, a good thing. But um, when you see commodity prices rising as they have been rapidly this year, and the PPI in China has been hovering around 8-9% uh, for a couple of months now, although the CPI is still much, much lower, 1.5%. Um, but the Chinese government aren't price fixing exactly. They do intervene in all sorts of commodity markets. They released their strategic reserve recently, some aluminum, some copper. They, yeah, the bully pulpit works a lot better in China than in the US. So when they say um, we don't like these prices, uh, the message just goes out to speculators. People liquidate. I spoke to a fertilizer company uh, just this morning and they were explaining about the uh, need for the distributors that they work with not to hoard inventory and push up prices artificially. So I think, I think CPI is more manageable uh, in China and it will be managed. Um, and this is relevant now to the core of this presentation, which is investing in Chinese financial assets uh, for foreign investors. Um, it's still not straightforward. There are regulatory hurdles and the currency, as we said, is not convertible, but there are the three connects bonds, equities, and wealth. Um, and I still, though, think that if you are um, 
international capital, you're better off on the whole investing through Hong Kong, certainly certainly for equities, uh, but even probably for bonds. Uh, you can buy and be bonds through your Hong Kong broker, of course. Um, but particularly the Hong Kong market, uh, the H shares have a really good discount to the A share comparables. Now, you don't get quite as much choice of company, and some of the better ones are only listed on domestic exchanges. However, if you have an option, uh, the H share is a good way to go. Um, now, uh, people have uh, gone bankrupt speculating uh, against the AH convergence by going long H shares and short A shares, uh, and it hasn't happened for 20 plus years. However, there were some interesting comments made by uh, regulators in November last year that uh, identified this as a market inefficiency, and that is the first step to something happening, and I do believe we will get convergence occurring over the next five years, and that will give an additional re investment return um, for equities where you have two classes of stock. Turning to bonds first, um, you know, there wasn't much foreign investment in Chinese bonds for a long time, really, until the Bond Connect uh, was launched. And then you can see the amount start to become significant, really, uh, in 2018 and onwards. Um, now, if you look at the relative yields um, of the US and China government bonds, uh, this is the five-year uh, on this particular chart, uh, you'll, you'll see that there's been a divergence that occurred uh, really around 2010, um, and that uh, real yields uh, post-global financial crisis have been um, significantly more interesting uh, in China. And I think you can now take that um, gap, uh, yield pick up, and probably add some currency uh, gains as well, uh, which suggests that uh, for corporate bonds as well, um, this is an interesting market to look at. We are an equity firm ourselves. We're interested in what moves equity markets. Um, Hong Kong Connect program, Northbound, um, shows relatively consistent uh, access to a whole range of equities um, which uh, have had uh, an increased flow uh, as the markets um, start to converge, part of the Greater Bay Area initiative by President Xi to bring that convergence about. A big part of it will be financial markets, Shenzhen Star and Hong Kong. Um, and then coming in, southbound from um, Chinese domestic investors, not nearly so much. However, what is very interesting here um, is what happened at the very end of last year, beginning of this year, a huge spike um, in activity um, caused by two reasons. One, structural, which was, I think, when funds and insurance companies were given um, more allowance to um, buy Hong Kong shares, which is good, again, for the Hong Kong market and for those of us who get our Chinese equity exposure primarily through the Hong Kong market, but also because when the US basically blacklisted a lot of uh, Chinese listed companies, um, then uh, we saw a big spike of buying after a big spike of US selling, and the national team came in to buy things like China Mobile and China Construction. Um, so I think we've got a lot of powerful forces building up here through the Stock Connect and the Wealth Connect, which allows high net worth individuals uh, to buy Hong Kong stocks directly without having a brokerage account in Hong Kong, um, and indeed, although quite a lot of them already do have. But perhaps most powerfully of all is this um, uh, series of charts, um, I've labeled it China Investor Preferences. This comes from research um, from a firm called China Reality Research, which is uh, largely contracted to um, CLSA, part nowadays of CITIC. Uh, one of the leading Chinese domestic brokers. They've been conducting polls of high net worth individuals and thousands of people in their sample uh, going back to January 2012. And what you can see here, I hope, um, in these, these colors, um, is that the bottom one is the domestic stock market uh, has been bobbing along up and down roughly 10-15% um, of Chinese investors have said domestic equity is their preferred place to put money uh, for most of this period, right up until actually this year when it changed. In January, you can see um, investor preferences moving into domestic equity um, and touching 20% for the first time and even 30% uh, in the most recent poll um, in June. And uh, this, of course, is very encouraging for positive fund flows into equity markets domestically um, and into Hong Kong indirectly as well. And you can even see 
uh, foreign um, equities showing up uh, in 2021 and before that, they're barely visible. So you've got more rich people, more ways to get at it through the Wealth Connect program, and you can see that more people in China are willing to put their money into equities. I think these are all positive trends, which brings us to, you know, why would you want to invest in China? Uh, and part of the reason uh, is what I'm calling the three unders. Now, I'm sure you've heard of all these programs in China. They normally are the five this is or the six that's. Uh, my reason why people should be looking to invest more in Chinese equities right now, be it through various pool vehicles or into Hong Kong market, is the three unders. Because China right now is under-owned, um, it's underperformed for a very long time as a market, and it's due a, a mean reversion, and thirdly, it's undervalued. So, First of all, let's look at Chinese equities against um, sort of other regions and other benchmarks. And you can see the uh, SH comp there. Uh, it, uh, it started out very expensive in the early days. Uh, not much choice and people were willing to pay an awful lot of money uh, on hope and theory rather than fact. But now, today, you can see it's the cheapest uh, of any of the major areas um, in equities in the world with P roughly uh, 15 times. Um, and this goes against the S&P, for example, which is you know, somewhere around 27, 28 um, at the moment. Um, I should just say then on the under-owned, um, China's always been under-owned relative to its, uh, both its, its uh, percent of national uh, equity value um, in terms of global context and relative to benchmarks. But it's never been as under-owned uh, as it is today since um, statistics were being created on this in 2005. Uh, so there's a dramatic skew, uh, particularly relative to the indices which are increasing their weightings to China, both in equities and bonds. Um, but international investors have never been so relatively underweight as they are right now. Um, underperformance as well. Uh, underperformance because the first part of this century, China outperformed right up until 2007, but since then, with a little bit of a, a wiggle and a blip from time to time, uh, it's underperformed all the way up till today, uh, dramatically so. So, you know, the relative total return um, from China has fallen from 0.024 to 0.01, uh, using 2000 as a base case, so it's again, you know, about as low as it's ever been uh, this century. And, and coming back to the valuations, uh, I've shown you a P, but a couple of other things um, are worth mentioning. I think yield, uh, look at the next slide here, yield. You can see that Chinese equities yielded uh, next to nothing uh, for a long time uh, and less than other markets, but, but now they're sort of in the pack, yielding uh, twice what they were at the start of this century. Um, I, I put our own fund up here, just a little bit of comparison there. We're, we're at 7% as opposed to 2% for Chinese equities. Um, and peg ratio. Uh, today, the, uh, the peg ratio of the CSI 300 is approximately 1, so price earnings growth ratio, uh, pretty attractive, I would argue. Uh, and it's that, that ratio of 1 is two standard deviations negative uh, compared to the whole of the last 15 years for equity multiples. So um, combined with ab relatively low uh, PE ratios, both an absolute sense, I think, and also relative to history and relative to other markets. And then, um, just by the way, I'll mention that our fund has a peg ratio of 0.5, uh, which is, of course, making it even cheaper uh, than the Chinese market. But um, policy priorities are what drives uh, or should drive your investment selection today. Um, you know, the China that we started investing in nearly 20 years ago it was a very different proposition than the one today. You know, when, when we were going there in 2002, 2003, uh, you wanted to buy things like construction and infrastructure. These sort of companies were high growth areas, you know, basic building blocks of society and the economy, and they were commanding 20 times, 25 times earnings, and now you can get them five or six. Export was what it was all about, building that base, China factory of the world, buy those companies. Basic products, because you were starting down at a pretty low standard of living, you know, paper towels, food companies, these sorts of things we wanted to own. Pea chips because private companies were well run and state-owned companies were absolutely awful capital allocators and value destroyers. Growth companies, if you, if you could tie all these things together and then 
foreign listings were pretty good to start with, particularly in the area of technology. Now, totally different picture. You want to make money in Chinese equities today, you have to do things completely differently. And you have to do them in line with what President Xi wants. Uh, go along, get along, and make money, uh, whether you like it or not. Project management and services um, are the things like property management really is a key uh, building block of this, uh, better quality of life for society. Managing those apartment blocks you see professionally and providing quality services, that is an area the state supports. And you want to be in areas the state supports. Uh, domestic consumption, a key part of the dual circulation policy, is leveling up and having money spent in China. And of course, with COVID, nobody can travel, so all that money that was being spent on travel is now being spent in China itself. And I think the Chinese government quite likes that. Um, not luxury, but mass luxury. So sportswear, uh, you know, electronic vehicles, but not premium Porsches. This is this is the, uh, the sort of migration um, in what the government is encouraging, and, and and people will tend to move in that direction. So again, you know, multiple re ratings are going to occur across sectors. Reforming SOEs. This is perhaps the single most important point. And when we started investing in China, we only bought P chips. 100% of our investment were P chips because private managers were motivated to do the right thing, make money, uh, grow the companies, deliver a high return on capital, and SOEs were not. But that's really changed. The risk reward ratio is completely different. Now, 80% of our portfolio in China is SOEs. And they're moving from a, a bad place, they're coming from a low base, but they're becoming better capital allocators. Um, they got, of course, a huge advantage in terms of credit availability, uh, much less risky, both, both from a financial and a political standpoint, policy involvement, so they normally hear about things earlier uh, and can position accordingly, and also um, industries which are being consolidated, some of them not particularly attractive, mature industries and not necessarily very good ESG candidates, but you can make a lot of money in industries that are being consolidated in China, is driving consolidation of its industries. And the slightly perverse effect of this is, you know, if you, if you consolidate the steel industry, the aluminum industry, the cement industry, and the renewable energy industry, uh, then actually the survivors make a lot more money. They have higher margins, higher return on equity, and therefore get higher multiples. And you can make very good money following that trend. And of course, companies coming home from America, as will happen. So uh, just to, to finalize uh, the, a few points here, if, if there's only one other thing that you take away from, from this is in China, you have to put policy first. You want to make money, you've got to be on the side of the government. Don't get into a place where you have a regulatory headwind. That will make it very difficult. You need your portfolio, whether it's equities, whether it's bonds, uh, to, to migrate to those industries that have government support or, or worse than neutral. And in my opinion, um, you need to align yourself as close as you can with the government and use SOEs, and that's what we do in our strategy. And I think that's a strategy which is going to uh, work best. It's certainly working better at the moment uh, than signing up and lining up uh, with entrepreneurs who might or might not be in the same on the same page as the government. Um, I would encourage you, if you have any further questions about this, uh, contact your representative. Uh, feel free to email me. I, Hope we'll all be able to get back to visiting China soon, and I wish you well with all your investments, Chinese and otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. That was very interesting. Next up is a comfort break where we'll be showcasing one of our videos. Please enjoy, and we'll see you back right afterwards.